I have to tell you, I pretty much nearly killed my dad. Well, I bet a lot of you did the same. Yeah. Back when I was 16, now my father didn't sign much, and I, I was a lip reader, and so we both sat down in, in the car, and I took the reins on the steering wheel and did my best. I turned, it, I turned on the car. I looked in my left rear view. I, I pulled out into the street. Did my best, you know, driving, and all the while my dad would try to get my attention to give me some little tidbit. Meanwhile, I'm trying to navigate, look around, not understanding what he's saying. He's gesticulating wildly in a near panic because we were almost hit by another car. I hit the brakes at the very last second, screeched to a halt, and we were saved. <laughs> Gasping for breath, he said, you're killing me, you're killing my heart here. You know, I, I apologize to my dad, but when I think of it, you know, today I drive with the greatest of ease. Nothing to it. When I compare the two experiences, the difference is habit. It's like tying your shoes. Remember when you were four or five and first learning to tie your shoes? You did it awkwardly and with great difficulty. But this morning, I'm sure you woke up, tied your shoes without a second thought and went about your day. A writer, Charles Durig, uh, spoke to the search for uh, the mechanism by which actions become habituated and become easy and wondered how we do this. How do we achieve our goals that, uh, in this way? One night, asleep in my bed, I was startled awake by remembering that my wife's birthday was the very next day. She woke, wondering why I'd woken in a panic. I said, oh, nothing, dear, nothing. Kissed her on her way back to sleep. But that just in that moment, I realized her birthday was the very next day, and I'd forgotten it. How many times has this happened to all of you? It happens. Our, our, our brains are amazing. We can do amazing things. But our memory is somewhat finite. Remember that we cannot possibly recall every single thing that we encounter. We can't do it. Another writer, David Allen, in his book, Getting Things Done, talked about the fact that we have external means of recording information, writing, we have devices that can record that information, that reduces the memory load that we have and frees up cognitive space for us. So now we see that creating a habit helps us. It makes us more efficient. So to look at this, we have to focus on a few things. You know, focus itself is not an easy thing. Humans are easily distracted. You know, in the past, uh, these things may have helped us make decisions about what we should do. If we look at the dawn of man and caveman, you know, the caveman was rumbling around his environment, foraging for whatever he could find, you know. And then just by sheer happy accident, picking up two stones and ambling on his way, he created a spark, which then created an ember, which who knows, might have uh, inflamed all of that, you know, uh, the furs of Vesity War. But he learned then of fire and then with repetition learned to make fire. We're faced with a deluge of, of stimulus today, and it's very difficult to focus in the midst of all of this. And so it's actually wasting more than we think. It's wasting money. And in fact, Dr. Gloria Mark in 2005 from the University of California, Irvine, spoke to how quickly we are distracted. It, we spend about 11 minutes getting ready to work, then we get distracted, and it takes some 25 minutes for us to get back on track. And in fact, the average worker is switching tasks around every three minutes. John Medina's book, Brain Rules, tells us that we are generally multitasking and distracted, and that this actually is happening in such a way that it creates 50% more effort, energy, and time to complete our task. 50% more than is needed. So we need to improve focus. This speaks clearly to that. But then what then is focus? Another writer, David Rock, said in his book, Your Brain at Work, says that distraction and focus is not the intense focus on a single task. It actually is the removal and lessening of distractors that allows us to tightly focus on work. Let's think of a rocket for a moment. 
once that ignition button is is hitting the rocket is uh, having its a uh, 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 fuel expended it's flying into the air you certainly can't call it back it's already mid-flight nearly in orbit so let's think then of distraction once that distraction is has uh, had its way you can't backtrack you are already distracted and it takes a great deal of effort and time to get back in focus so we have to think then about how we set up our environment do we turn our computers our phones our televisions and all of our devices off do we shut off some of this external stimuli if we do then we have much greater focus and much more efficient productivity if we think about the money that we spend on uh, you know, uh, or on our books, on our paper, on all of these sorts of things, much of it is wasted. It sits idle and we don't use most of it. And because we spend the money on these, you know, self-help books, whatever it might be, and we don't think to use it. it it's not habit. How then do we habituate ourselves to using the resources around us? This requires a process of metacognition, wherein we question and examine our own ways of thinking and being. So we really have to take an inward look and examine how we think, how we feel. This is the act of metacognition. So in doing so, we can solve a great deal of the problems in our environment. In his blog, Zen Habits, Leo Balbuta says, speaks to the problem of needing people to become more aware of how to metacognitively question themselves and their own processes. You know, because you can really shake yourself up and get on the right track by doing so. But this act of metacognition is not hard. The difficult part of it is becoming habituated to that self-examination. So that has to be done through developing a habit of self-examination that occurs repeatedly. We have to uh, periodically take time to examine how we're thinking, how we're processing. That will prove a remedy for many of the problems that we have. And that's easy for us as adults to conceptualize and learn how to do, but we have to think about how children are taught to metacognitively examine themselves throughout their lives. When I look back on the experience of elementary school and we think about if we were to invite, uh, design those environments where people can think about and metacognitively examine their stressors, from an early age we see great strides made in education. So we can see benefits both in school and outside of the school to, by, to doing so because we remove some of the distractions. We have metacognitively assessed how to lessen those distractions. So that helps in the educational environment, but then in the external environment when we encounter bullying, when we encounter anything, any problem in our lives, these young children, these students can metacognitively examine their options, their ways of thinking about uh, the problem at hand and better determine solutions. It won't solve everything, but it allows them to think about those solutions, even if they make the wrong choice from it. It's far better than the, than the typical scenario of asking a, a child why they did something and I don't know. So there are boons to be had from this. So the way that we go about this is by asking, by modeling, and by empowering. At school, if we're developing programs to improve these metacognitive skills, that asks the question. That begins to teach them how to ask. And then we model it by demonstrating to them how we metacognitively assess our own processes. We empower them then by letting them take over these own processes, asking these prompting questions, and then helping them to examine themselves in this metacognitive manner, examine their judgment, examine their perceptions, and then solicit from them what their ideas for solutions are. Then they can then have owned that process. They have taken control of their own thinking, feeling, and, and, and behaviors. We've empowered them to do so by teaching them these metacognitive skills. Habits help. Metacognition helps us. So the marriage of the two can have profound impact. We can then reduce the clutter, that mental clutter. If we see in the external world schools and programs beginning to teach us metacognition in this way, then Throughout the world, students will have already learned how to eliminate or deal with these distractors. They'll be more efficient, they'll be more in control of their own thoughts, behaviors, and feelings 
they'll have much greater ownership. So this message is really for the world. It is at hand. We can do this. Every one of you can make this happen. Thank you very much.